Hey everyone, it's your host Marcus Norman of Gentleman Style Podcast Show, and today we are going to talk about uh, a really, it's not gone, it's not missing, right? It's still here, it's just not as predominant. We're going to talk about COVID-19, but this special lady is near and dear to my heart. She has survived long COVID. And she has done something absolutely unique, and it has moved her and inspired her to launch her brand, her company, Holly and Porter International, and cause a retreat and so many different powerful things. She's built a community around this and really taken off recovering from COVID. And so you all won't want to miss one second of what this powerhouse speaker has to say. You won't want to miss one second. Here we Go. Hey everyone, it's your host Marcus Norman of Gentleman Style Podcast Show, and I have this epic lady, Miss Holly Port. Miss Holly's life is a tapestry of incredible experiences, starting with not one, not two, but multiple healing journeys. And we all need this, right? We are in a time or a season of our life where we are not doing well. And Holly Porter, I want to say, has unlocked some key principles that we all need to embody and 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 maybe just maybe we'll have a, a, a breakthrough in our own lives. And she is also near and dear to my heart. Her fans love her. I've grown to love her. I've fallen deeply in love with what she's doing and the movement she's on because she is a survivor of long COVID, hospitalized for over a month, 70 days of battling COVID. And she's here to give back and pour into, you'll see the incredible heart of this woman. So I can't hold this lady back. Please help me welcome to the stage, the incredible Holly Porter. Miss Porter, thank you for being here on the Gentleman Style Podcast stage, ma'am. You are phenomenal. And I want to say thank you for being here. You're epic. You're amazing. What you are doing in the world, your philanthropy work, your, your, your heart is prevalent in everything you touch, a pure heart of gold. So thank you for being here. Thanks, Marcus, for having me. You make me want to listen to my own podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's you. You have done the work and you're a true inspiration. And again, it, it shows, right? It shows on your social media, everywhere, Instagram, TikTok, wherever people can find you. It shows the heart of a person. And that's that's what really is missing from, from entrepreneurship. That's missing with business and that's missing in the world. You don't see enough people like you. Right. Oh. And so I want to ask before we dive deep, how what was the start? What was the catalyst for you that got you started in in entrepreneurship, philanthropy? Where, where did it all start? Your mom and dad entrepreneurs <laughs> or is there a rich uncle somewhere? Uh, I wish. No, <laughs> I am from a family of entrepreneurs, but I think the defining moment when I wanted to be one was when I was 12 years old. My dad was super smart. I'm from a family of nine siblings. Well, not eight siblings, there's nine kids. And he had my older sister, three years older, work at his office. And he was a mason. So it was a construction office in Las Vegas. So in the summer, we would go there and earn our school clothes money. He had us work. And I remember he was paying me $2.50 an hour back then, because I'm old. <laughs> and you look great. Thanks. And he, um, I, I saw the minimum wage requirement, you know, poster that they have to hang in the on the wall. And it said $3.35. And I remember that was kind of a defining moment for me thinking, I'm getting gypped. <laughs> I'm not even making with the losses he's supposed to be paying me. Anyway, and from then on, I just, I would say I always had some kind of a little philanthropy, something going on, some little business, all kinds of businesses. I've had 11 startup companies, but that doesn't count all of the little stuff that I did or, you know, maybe makeup companies or whatever. Anyway. I told y'all, I told y'all, a true heart of gold. And, and I want to stick right here for a second, right? 11 startup companies. That's no small task. It's no small feat. You know, I think what, um, uh, Donald Trump had what 15 okay. businesses at one at one point. Um, 
what what that's no small feat. What drives your entrepreneur's spirit? And can you share some of your most memorable business experience with our followers? Because that's sure. that's that's profound. Well, I couldn't have 15 at once. I guess if you can afford managers and CEOs to run them, that would be great. But I wasn't, I didn't have like these billion dollar companies. I'm building one now, but in the past it was, I had um, four children and then married my husband and we had four more. Or no, well, he had four. So that was eight altogether teenagers. We had seven of them living in the house at one time. So most of my life in and my businesses grew with my children. So I had like a, um, oh, a daycare when they were younger. And then I had a preschool. Then I had a kid's clothing store. And then I had a fundraising company when they were doing sports and raising money I, I bought into. So I had three or four companies most of the time at the same time. And we raised our kids that way. We I remember one of my, I had a salon and spa. That was one of my longest. And I've had that. I had that for 20 years. We had eight business licenses coming to that office. So I had, I'm a real estate broker. I had a real estate office in there the hair salon and spa going on. I mean, it was just the contracting uh, company that we have. It, it was just like always something moving along to keep, I, it's, I just got bored easy. And it wasn't that I wasn't happy doing what I was doing. It served its purpose. And I just knew how to move on. Some of them we sold, some of them we closed down. They just, or I moved and they just ended. Um, so all different reasons of why we did different things, but I could never tell you what my real passion was. Like I would be happy about what I was doing until I wasn't. And then, like I said, I would, I would not do it anymore. I believe that happiness is number one. And if you can figure out a way to combine your entrepreneurship and your happiness together, you're going to be way more successful. First of all, because really when we hire coaches, it's like, you hire coaches, you think for your business, but it really ends up being about your personal. Because when your personal life is in order, your business life is in order. Wouldn't you agree? I agree. Totally agree. One thousand percent agree. Yeah. I, I want to ask you again, with all that experience, I often run into people who struggle. They struggle with managing like two two jobs. They struggle with managing. You You did all this with a family, husband, married, um, probably there's parts in your life where you weren't married um, and you was doing all of these. Can you share some tips? Because a common thing I see people struggle with is they can't balance it all. How do you, how did you, and even now, how do you juggle all these things? Is it spreadsheets? Is it a secretary? Is it a virtual assistant? How do you juggle everything? What helps the most? Well, I probably had all the above. Right now, it's it's just my calendar. I set alarms for everything to remind me things. Just when I'm working at my desk, I get so involved in whatever I'm doing at the time that I can miss appointments. And so I just get on my phone. I'll be like, oh, it's in 45 minutes. And I'll be like, in, in 40 minutes, I'll have an alarm go off. That's how I, but back then, it really, it's it, again, the calendaring, I think getting organized enough with your time, because sometimes we can just, everybody has the same 24 hours to do their thing. And some just can't function as well as others, right? And doing that and juggling. And it's funny because I don't know if I necessarily do. I, I'd have to, because I've been able to get a lot of things done. But when we've had three or four companies at a time, which is a lot of the years, people would say to me, I never can figure out how you can do so many things at, at once and still do them well. Well, I will say, I'm the first to admit, I didn't do them as well as I could have. For instance, my kids, you know, I wanted to be there for them. So I always, being an entrepreneur, you can work your schedules. But I noticed now looking back, my biggest regret is that I was present. I showed up at those soccer games and I was on the field, but I was on the phone doing a real estate deal. So was I really there? I wasn't present. And I think that that is a big deal is if you can figure out your time and there's so many books. I mean, you type YouTube university is free. You can learn anything you want. Uh, Chat GPT, go on there. You can really get any information is out there free. If you want to learn a skill or you want to know how to do something, it'll write you a, a novel on GPT. I am on there all the time. I use it for business and it makes things so much faster. But I think it's just getting 
set right in your mind to know that you can do hard things. You can make it work. I mean, we had, like I said, we had seven kids. We actually lived about 25 miles out of town as well. So juggling that extra piece of it and keeping kids involved in sports and school and anything else they were had going on. I'm not going to lie. It, it wasn't easy. And, and you're right. I was single some of the time I had four kids. I was driving a hundred miles a day at one time to my children's clothing store. So I had three of them in school. One of them went to work with me and it was like a children's resale store. So yeah, Hunter, you know, we were there, we were gone 10 hours a day making this work. And I was single at the time and it, it was, it was challenging, but I think we can do hard things. We really can. So you included the kids in the entrepreneurial endeavors. You didn't exclude them. You didn't keep it separate. You allowed them to free flow with you. Yeah. Like one of our businesses that I didn't count in my 11, cause this was something I, we did a snack shack. And so it was at the ball fields and my kids would run the snack shack. So I didn't really make any money, but they got paid and we taught them those skills. We bought a little shave ice machine and they did that like with a little cart. I mean, we just had little ways that I taught them responsibility. And I also would do what my dad did to me. You buy, I'll buy your shoes, you buy your school clothes. And some of them were smart and they would be frugal about it and they could get a whole bunch of clothes for you know, the same amount of money as some wanted more quality and they would spend more money on one or two items and not have as much. And that we didn't care. I, that was just the point of whatever's going to work for you. We want to support. And I think most of our kids are entrepreneurs. And I think that that's not a bad thing um, to create that for you. You're a lot flexible on your schedules. Co one thing COVID taught us is that people can work from home. And it, and it started a ton of businesses. I can't remember the stats right now, but there was so many businesses started during COVID. And I love that. Absolutely. I, I want, I, this, I'm going to be selfish right now, right here real quick, because this is where I get to pick the brains of huge, huge people like yourself and get some insight. Do you give your children an allowance or do you allow them to earn it? Because you, you touched on it. You said, this is what happened to you. This is how your dad did it. Do you give your kids an allowance or do you allow them to earn? Which one Which one works for your family? Oh, How do you do it? That's interesting. I've done both. So in the summer, I'll say what, what worked the best for us is in the summer, I made this file card. And, you know, there's lots of better ways probably to do it now. But put a big, big file box and each card had a job on it. And they weren't allowed to go and shuffle them. Right? It was okay. like whatever job came up, you got to choose. This is how much you made. And you got to choose if you want to do that job and make this amount of money for that job. And some of them only needed done like once a month or whatever. So they had to go. Anyway, I was smart about what came up next because it was what I wanted done in the house. Right. But those, <laughs> those, that were, those that wanted to make money and money motivated them to make money to go do whatever they wanted to do. They would do the jobs and those that didn't really care, they wouldn't. And that's that probably worked better than anything because it taught them. They got to work for their money and they also got the reward of not only getting money, but getting to use it for whatever they wanted. And so, but we've done everything we did. We did an allowance for a little while and the age differences got more and less. Everybody didn't get the same because they don't have the same needs. Right. Why'd you, why'd you stop the allowance? Why'd you change that to having them earn it? To be honest with you, we had um, an embezzlement in our concrete construction company. And mm. so probably because we couldn't afford to pay them. Yeah. 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 I think that's where that kind of went out the window. And, and again, when we got married, you know, most of them were teens. So some had jobs, some didn't. Yeah. We, we did it all. We tried every little thing. And, and I can't say that one worked better than the other. It was just like, it's like my businesses. When I started something, it, I followed the ages of my kids to what would work with my schedule. And that's kind of what we did with the money. It's like what worked with us, we made work. But you you know results if people are happy about it. <laughs> if they're not happy about it, you, you hear all about it, right? Kids are like, good, like to whine. This is <laughs> true. Like to whine. That's true. That's true. Do you, is your husband an entrepreneur? Yes. He, so he does concrete and he has had, he's done it for 41 years. We figured out the other day, 
he's done. He doesn't want to do it anymore. It's so hard on your body. And he also has his real estate license. Um, it's inactive right now because he's still doing his other company, but he's making a big life change. He's looking, he's getting a CDL license and probably going to drive um, a big uh, truck big, for big. my, one of my kids that we brought in as partners for a few years. And then he went out on his own and he's just blown up. So um, he'll probably go drive truck for him for now. And, that's okay. It's but that's hard when you've only done that your whole life. Like me, I can change on a dime. It's like, oh, tomorrow if I'm like, man, eh, I'm done with that. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> we'll we'll just add this to my plate. Um, yeah, I, but I can juggle. But that's my personality. That is not his. He's have just, you yeah. have you ever worked a nine to five? Have Have you ever worked a job or corporate America like a traditional? I did. Um, let's see. My fourth child was there was a gap because of a divorce and a remarry. Um, I did. I worked at a, I cleared people's credit in Las Vegas. And then, and hmm. the funny thing was they, they had our number, the, the credit bureaus had our number. And when I moved back to Utah, I don't know why, cause I don't watch TV. I don't watch it now, but back then it happened to be on and I was at my mom's and I walked by and they had Dateline on and they were interviewing the lady on Dateline in a hidden camera that had my job. That was scary. I was like, ooh, dodge the bullet. Anyway, I yeah, it was it was kind of nervous. But I did that for a little while. And then I I waitressed off and on over the years. And so I wasn't necessarily nine to five, but I did that and, and I enjoyed it. But people are the reason I do things. I that's that's the whole everything I do is usually service based and people oriented. Told y'all. Told y'all. A heart of pure gold, Holly Porter. One more round of applause for Miss Porter here. This is huge. So y'all, she's helping us get to a better place, a better frame of mind, and she's giving us some some tea here. Um, you've always your business is big wise. Um, what is a core message or philosophy that guides you? Right, I, I experts like yourself, professionals working at a very high level have a philosophy can you share one or two of yours that you re that really stick to the the, the the gut right do you have any philosophy you could share with our audience to help them through their struggles or their business ventures well the first thing that came to my mind when you asked that was was resilience you've got to know when it's tough when the tough gets going, the going gets tough or the tough. What is that saying? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I, I said that backwards. That's how I say We it. know what you, we with you, we with you. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I think that just have that grit and yeah. really just know it's no easy task to be an entrepreneur. People think sometimes it's, they look at someone and they think, Oh, oh, they're, it's like real estate. They, they look at an agent and they're like, oh, they're just making all this money. They don't realize that's getting split four ways usually, right? And, and then you've got all your expenses on top of that. So they just see people just are so judgmental and, and I'm guilty. I'm not saying I, I do work on that to try to see all sides and just really look at the big picture of things. But I think your mindset, that would be number one. Not If your mindset's not right, your bank account's not right. Your family life's not right. Your mindset needs to be first. Facts. Has your family supported everything you've done? Have you had some naysayers in your life come up where they were just talking <laughs> negative to you? Who's been your biggest advocates? Great question. Surprisingly, I guess, because I don't care if they support me or not. They're not <laughs> paying my bills, right? <laughs> And that being said, um, so my husband and I have been married all over 22 years now, and definitely, he, 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 right? And we left, left we, survived, we survived eight kids. Trust me, we can survive anything. <laughs> but he, he's, he's a great guy. He, he says you're self-sustaining because I say, oh, it's a good thing we're probably still married. You let me do whatever I want. He just supports all these crazy ideas, and. And sometimes he'll give me his opinion, but he's not negative about anything. And that's helpful. But it's interesting you ask that question because now that I'm building a software company, that's tech and, and it's different. Real estate has its own language. Entrepreneurship has its language. Corporate has its own language. Well, tech has its own language and it's a totally different language. It's like learning a new language. I feel like I've been in, in a college, you know, learning stuff. So on a learning curve for the last two and a half years, but 
it within tech, it's just so different. And so I, I've had, yeah, I've had a little bit of naysayers, um, not against the idea because the idea, honestly, I'm going to, I'm going to say it was from above because it, it's a brilliant idea. All right. And it's not being done. And so I'm building the plane as we go. I'm learning the tech as we go and, and raising the money as we go. And so I have had a little bit more, um, naysayers, not, not against it. Like you shouldn't do that, give up on the dream, whatever. But I never knew until I was in my coma, I never had that why and that passion of, no, this is like my calling. I'm supposed to be where I'm at now. I'm supposed to be doing it. And I have stories behind that that'll give you chills of why I know that. And I, I've always had that little gift of knowing. People have gifts. People have their intuition. Everyone has intuition if you tap into it. But that I've always had that. People say, how do you know that? I'm not psyche. I just know that. I know what I know. And this is that knowing uh, without a shadow of a doubt that this is supposed to happen. This is the end result. Now I just got to figure out all the crap in between and how you're going to get there and who's going to help me get there. And the right people are going to show up and they have. And I, I believe that. I know that with all my heart and soul. And I just know what I'm creating, how many people it's going to serve and and help. And that's what it's about. On that, on that, we're going to, speaking of service, we have one quick commercial break. You guys don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. Stay with us. We'll be right, right back. Baby Gear Services DMV specializes in high quality baby gear rentals in the Maryland and DC metro area. We have a wide range of baby gear items for rent, including wooden cribs, car seats, high chairs, and more. We also offer seasonal specials and free delivery. Our prices are very versatile to cover every budget. Wooden cribs start at $17 a day, high chairs and even car seats start at $5 a day. Check out our website, www.bgsdmv.com. Good day, podcast listeners. This is your boy, Marcus Norman of Gentleman Style Podcast Show. I wanted to let you guys know that we will be rolling out a new feature and adding a join sponsor button next to the subscriber button here at the bottom of your screen. Once you click the button, it will display three membership levels. Gentleman Gentry, which is our entry level. Duke Duchess, which is our season level and the Emperor and Empress, which is our most sophisticated level, which you will receive unique perks and benefits at each differing level and gain access to our community tab. We will also be sharing polls, upcoming events, and interviews, as well as receive feedback from our sponsors directly. Your support helps me find new and exciting guests to bring to the stage live. Well, in order to get the higher end speakers, it requires, well, some, you guessed it, money. So thank you for tuning in to my channel. And if becoming a sponsor sounds good to you, then select the join button below and choose your desired sponsor level. Let's continue to grow and serve the future of generations of men and women to come. Love you guys. Bye. We are back to the Gentleman Style Podcast Show, and we have the incredible Miss Holly Porter. She's giving business tips, business strategies, home life, balance, balance your life, um, heart life, all of the above. If you miss that, go back, scroll back, and watch. We are on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Audible, Radio.com, Facebook, Facebook business page, YouTube, and anywhere you get your podcast today. Check her out. She's absolutely fun. Phenomenal and a true heart of gold. Miss Porter, you've written nine books, nine incredible books. I'm going to tell you which one is my favorite, but first I want to ask which one is yours? Um, well, I'm actually up to like 15 now. If yes. I count what I'm with part of other people's books as well. But okay. my favorite is probably my first one, you know, because when it's your first one, it's more your heart and soul. It's it's just a 60 page read. It's called Inbox, Outbox, Unbox, No Box, Four Steps to Delete Your Box Thinking. 
<laughs> it's a tongue twister. And it's a mindset book and it teaches you in, it does a, it asks you a quiz, 15 questions, I think that um, if you were a shoe, what kind of shoe would you be? And takes the four personality personas in shoes and teaches you how to step out of your box thinking in your personality style. So it was, it was just a fun project and I love doing uh, personality things and anyway, and then the money profiles goes with that. It's the same quiz. So one's money, mo one's money set, money mindset and one's mindset. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Yeah. So I'm going to share what my favorite book is. I, and I'm curious about it because, and I need to get my hands on it. <laughs> this is, uh, is your book 30 Rules That I Wish I Knew in My 20s by 30 Women in Their 30s? Yeah. And that book stands out to me because I say that almost practically every day. I think that's like every entrepreneur's thing is like, if I did this, I would be here right now. And if I had done this, can you share some, some, some nuggets? What should women know? in their twenties and thirties that they should be working on beforehand or, or right at that mark. Cause that's gold, right? Yeah. That's what the money is. So that was a book series called, I call it the rules book. So there were two of the 40, 40 rules because that's my age group. It was 40 and up. People are like, when are you going to do a fifties? I'm like, it is done 40 and up. <laughs> and then <laughs> it was so popular that I got 40 other women. So the whole series has 110 women in it. And we asked, all the same questions. So each book had its own set of questions. I think it was only about seven questions and they had a thousand words. They could answer the questions however they wanted. And they gave us their, their feedback. And so, gosh, me thinking back. So, um, and then I was going to do the 2020, by the way, but working mm. with a bunch of millennials just was not working out. <laughs> oh my gosh. And I was going to do a men's one, but I just never had enough men to do it. Cause you've got to do that age group. So if I had a 40, 40 rules for men, it would be 40 men. And I just didn't have 40 men jumping around saying, I want to be part of that. So I just like let that series kind of sit where we were and we did another 40, 40 rules. Um, but this 30, 30, yeah, that was, so that was like thinking that the twenties, I mean, when I was 20, I was married at 18. Mm -hmm. So in my twenties, I was a busy mom. I had a kid at 18, 20 and 22 and 26 were my, mm -hmm. so I was young and I was busy. I had my daycare. Um, yeah, it was it was crazy time. So like, do I remember my 20s? Not for the most reason most people don't remember their 20s. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> Absolutely fair. Go check out the book. Check out all her books. Um where can can our audience find these these series of books? You can just get them on my website uh hollyporter.com or holly hollyporterinternational.com. Both of them will take you there and there's a shop you can go in there and I think you're right. There is nine on there. My other ones I don't have because I don't have as many copies and I like to fulfill them. I don't have them go through Amazon because I'll sign the book and I'll usually do a little thank you card when I mail it out. So that's a little bit more personalized. Absolutely. The heart. I told y'all the heart <laughs> in everything she touches. I said that in the very beginning. <laughs> oh my gosh. Miss Porter, I, I want to touch on the heart of you and leading into your nonprofit and, and, and the heart of you, you, you went through long COVID. You spent 70 days hospitalized. That's no easy task. That's that's And COVID is such a, was a crazy virus because you're sick, but no one can come see you. And those that come yes. you have to mask up, hazmat suit, oxygen tank. It's, it's, it's Armageddon. It's like, um, tell us what happened. How did it happen? How do you feel the emotions of this? Oh, wow. That's such a loaded question. I well, know. First, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Um, so interrupt me if you need a clarification at all. I gave you permission for that. Um, so when I got it, I got the Delta version. It was fall of 2021. I went to a conference and got it and came back and I'm sure I infected a bunch of people on the airplane. So I'm sorry. And I pray every day that none of them died um, because you just don't know what you don't know. I never thought I'd get COVID. I was super healthy, walked into the hospital on no drugs, uh, walked out on a dozen. I'm drug free now by choice. And they had no records on me. Like there was no baseline of anything. I had, my oxygen was 63 when I walked in there. I was in the ICU 
in a room from the ER to the ICU within less than 30 minutes, which if you've been, ever been to the ER, you know, that's like impossible. Yes, so that's how bad they knew I was. When I was in there, you could, you could have one person every 24 hours. And so my husband and I infected the week we were home. And it and a half weeks. And so my sisters took turns and they stayed every 24 hours. Um, I had a daughter that came some of the time, but mostly these two twin sisters, they saved my life by being there because intuitively they knew somehow that I needed them there. Like I'm really independent, but somehow they, I don't know if it was for accountability for the medical staff, just for the energy of it. I mean, people loved coming in my room, they said, because it just felt it was so icky in the hospital at the time because, I mean, so many people were dying. I mean, I had, a, I had a friend that's husband I met later, and he said, I was, I deliver medical equipment. And he said, I can't tell you how many medical or how many body bags we brought there. And he said, I remember his wife telling him I was in the hospital and how bad I was. And she just said, I don't think she's going to make it. And he said, I remember one of the deliveries thinking, I hope she's not coming out in one of these. I mean, just horrible things. Half the people that were in there were dying. Um, it was a horrible, horrible time, right? And we all have a COVID story. Mine's not extra special. We all lost somebody we probably knew and we all were affected um, physically, mentally, financially. I can't think of one thing that affected the whole world at one time besides COVID. And wow. I know we all want to forget about it. But do you know there are a hundred million documented cases of long COVID? And when I started with the nonprofit two and a half years ago, there was 65 million. Then it went to 85. Now it's over a hundred. I think people are realizing they're putting two and two together, realizing that these symptoms that I'm having, there's over 200 symptoms linked to it, that they're realizing that that's long COVID. And doctors didn't know, right? We're, we're the statistics for them. And I, I was told in my coma to start that nonprofit. I was given the name. I don't, I don't think, I don't remember it being called long COVID because nobody knew what long COVID was. Um, that was a newer thing, but it was to support the COVID sufferers and which became the long COVID people because of the ones suffering, right? That didn't get better. Um, and honestly, the, the hope around it is there are a lot of people that got it in 2020 that are now a hundred percent better. So there is hope that people are, I'm way better. I'm probably 85% better from where I was. Um, I do have a list of diagnoses, which really stink that I didn't have before, but it's a mindset. I feel like better is better and I'm going to do everything I can to get well because people like me that got it, I was intubated twice. I had a trach, I had sepsis, I had other life-threatening infections that I don't know the names to. There's no reason why I should have walked out of there with my life, right? And and I did. And so I don't wanna waste a day. I have things to do. God told me in my coma, things to do. I had out-of-body experiences, many, many funny stories too. I had a near death experience and I had a spiritual transformational experience. So I don't, for me, it's, it's God's my higher power for whatever it is for you and your listeners. That was it for me. And I specifically knew what to do just to have that. It was almost like, Oh, here, here's your, here's your manual. Now go follow it. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember that week before you got hospitalized? Do you remember how you were feeling or what you were feeling or, uh, or, or that? Well, so we were in a fifth wheel waiting for our house to close and we were living um, on my dad's property, which was nice. It's like a spa. It wasn't, we weren't roughing it, <laughs> and, but we were waiting for our house to close and, and I came home sick with it. So um, we'd only been there, I think a couple weeks before this, but we couldn't close on the house because nobody knew if I was going to live or die. So we had to let that house go. And uh, we were in there for a week, a full week. And I remember, I, I, I remember texting people, but I bet it didn't make sense. I was so sick. My husband got it, you know, two days after me, 
but he, he did end up on oxygen, but he didn't ever have to get hospitalized. So I don't know how he drove us. I think we were so scared to give it to somebody because we knew how sick we were. People were bringing us food and just leaving it outside on the steps. We wouldn't even open the door because we didn't want anyone else to have it. So we never thought about calling an ambulance. I woke up about 4.30 in the morning after a week and said, we got to get to the hospital. I'm in trouble. I, I can't breathe. And so he drove us there somehow. And by the time he parked the car and came in, they already had me in the ICU <laughs> that quick. It was like, okay, upstairs. Um, yeah, it was, it was, so I don't remember a lot about that week. Um, other than I remember reading a few texts later that I text people. They, they really didn't make sense. That's, that's, that's huge. And, and, you know, this, the fight that you go through, I can imagine looking at the pictures, the fight that you had to fight. Um, it's a battle. Yeah, it's a battle, and and, and it, it caught the world by by shock and awe and storm, and it just really took took a doozy on us. And you're right, um, suffering it, suffering from it myself. Um, you never get back to a hundred percent, I don't think. But like you, I feel like 85, 80 percent back. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And but it changes you. It 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 oh. humble it humbled me. Yeah. It it really when you face your mortality, that does something to you. Where yeah. tomorrow you you might not wake up. You close your eyes and you might not wake up. And so um I, I don't I didn't have I don't think I had a, a out of body experience, but I definitely grappled with my spirituality. I I hate I for I remember one specific moment I I was angry I was really angry I was angry at everything everybody the world nurses I remember I was being a but I remember I was being a butthole to my nurse the nur because you know she was they would come in and they're sticking me in my stomach with the blood thinners oh, yeah. and medications every hour <laughs> every hour and it's it's brutal they're checking your vitals and it's it you know i didn't have family i didn't uh -huh. have anyone to come up and check on me oh. so the 30 plus days i was hospitalized it was me and the nurse uh, so, um and that one i was just angry and i i remember my nurse coming in and she was like you going you okay you feeling better today cuz i had an attitude <laughs> i wanted to leave i was fighting to to be checked out because i was so tired of being sticked and pricked and looking at my vitals and, you know, nobody really giving me anything, telling me what's right. really going on. Am I improving? Am I getting worse? What's going probably on? probably don't know. <laughs> right. Because COVID was new to everybody and they're just doing their checks and they don't, they don't know if it's up or down or what. They just know you're still here. They're yeah. basically checking, Hey, you're alive. This, <laughs> this is our protocol for this week. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, and yeah, I was, I was angry from it. I do remember that I was really angry from it. And my dad called me on my cell phone and he's like, your, your nurse and your doctor say you're rejecting everything. You're not taking your medication. You're not, you're refusing, you're refusing a lot of the treatment. Um, and he's like, stop being a butt, let them do what they have to do. Yeah. And you know, it's my dad, you know, so I like, okay. And the nurse comes in, she's like, you don't, you calm down now and i'm like <laughs> yeah i'm i'm better but uh, covid long covid is no joke miss yeah. porter this sets you on a path surviving covid has set you on a path to build you you are a true entrepreneur from beginning to end your nonprofit the venturebucketwish.org tell us what you are on a mission to do now yeah, really, it's it's to raise awareness that people don't understand. People still don't know what long COVID is. So really, if you have an after 90 days, you're still having some symptoms, some medical things or you have new things. I mean, I've had melanoma twice since since then. That's the most deadliest cancer there is. I mean, it just catches things on fire. Rheumatoid arthritis, tons of autoimmune are showing up. So I would educate someone not, that's listening that doesn't understand that maybe they have something. Think back. Did it start happening after you had COVID? 
because it probably is in that category of long COVID. And for us, we just wanted the awareness to be out there, the support of these people because they're getting gaslit from their doctors. The doctors don't understand. I had one of my doctors pretty much fire me because I wanted to go more holistic. And he's like, well, if you're going to go down that path, then I'm probably not the right doctor for you. I'm like, why do I need drugs to get better? If I think I can do it holistically, support that, right? And so I think it's just getting that out there. We started a podcast. We have people that have um, that are sufferers of long COVID. We have medical, holistic, uh, science-based people, and also caretakers. So we're trying to get all the ends of people on there that they can come on and get not only hope, but they can get educated. We also grant experiences. Um, that's where the wish part comes in, where people with long COVID, uh, we have been able to pay for them to do something and experience. I'm more about giving someone a memory than just a wish, right? It's like, let's create a memory of something they want to do. We haven't done near as many as I want to just because of um, my health journey. It hasn't been the greatest. I'm, I'm a lot better now. But during all this, we started the nonprofit. And then, you know, I've had a lot of relapses and things. So it's raw and real. It's just how it is. I mean, just here we are. And and it's I'd love to be able to raise more money. We've done a gala and at our gala, um, it was very successful, but it just takes money to do things to be able to help more people um, on our website. By the way, if it's something that's calling to your heart, you can sign up and do a one time donation. You can also do a monthly donation, um, even as low as twenty five dollars helps. And that way we can help support this and we are also teaming up with other organizations for long covid they're starting to get awareness out a lot more even though most people they don't want to hear about it our podcast would help be helpful if you'll go subscribe to it um it's um hopeful horizons podcast so hopeful horizons podcast and that's on youtube just because people see and they see the word covid and they just don't want to hear about it we've actually thought about not focusing on just long COVID, but keeping it more autoimmune related for that reason, because people don't want to hear about it. It's like, but the people with long COVID, they're suffering and they want the support. <laughs> so right. catch 22. Thanks. So the goal with the found with the nonprofit is to support those with currently active um, long COVID symptoms. Yes. Which are a lot of them have autoimmune. Autoimmune is, is probably the biggest thing that most people are getting rheumatoid arthritis and fibromyalgia, you know, with the fatigue, there's 200 symptoms linked to long COVID, but I would say about 20 of those really quite crossover. So no two people are alike. I've never seen long COVID the same in anybody because those symptoms just are so different and mine come in waves. Like I've got tinnitus that never stops. So I have to sleep with um, my sensory issues because of it. So I sleep with a mask with my, um, so it covers the light. So I, the light um, stays out of my eyes. And then I listen to binaural beats or affirmations all night long in my ears because of the ringing, because it gets louder as I go to bed because I'm listening, right? And just like things that you have to figure out. I have to wear a CPAP now. Um, I didn't have to before. So I look really cool at night. I'm scary, actually. <laughs> I have all this stuff on and I'm claustrophobic. And I like that was a mindset in itself to just like train your brain. So you have something covered you here. You have a full face mask, stuff over your head. Like it's scary, you know, because I, I was intubated and tricked. And it's like anything that's going to take your breath away, even though they're giving me breath, it, it's just you have to learn that people have that anxiety and depression and PTSD. If you were in the hospital and you probably have had little triggers here and there, it creates PTSD. Any, I, I wanted to sky or scuba dive. And I found myself a few months out of the hospital watching some scuba divers on a show. And I noticed like I was having like kind of a panic attack. I was breathing really heavy because it was that memory of the weight and not being able to catch your breath. And, feeling like you're underwater. And I was like, Oh, I'm taking that off my bucket, bucket list, wish. no, nope, not doing that. And so it just mentally, it's just preparing all these different things. Sorry. I hope that answered your question. I kind of went all over with that, but no, it did. It answered my question and it touched on the mental, 
beforehand, mm -hmm. right? There's a mental aspect and people don't even realize, like I told you, I became very agitated from being just hospitalized for so long, not on top of the long COVID symptoms that I was suffering through. So I'm in pain, physical pain, suffering, can't breathe, hard to breathe. My lungs are of, have shrunk to the size of a peanut, you know, a golf ball. And, you know, I'm getting pricked every hour. Right. right? And so that, does a toll and yeah. that's like mental a mental toll so that you've answered two questions by sharing that and i thank you Come i have on. a story can i share a story when because you said it a couple of times well first of all i have a couple of funny things too when i was in there i had a salon and spa for 20 years like i mentioned so a lot of hairdressers in my family but my one twin sister is a hairdresser they, while I was in the ICU, they waxed my eyebrows, they shaved my legs. My daughter, she did nails. She came in and did my toes. They gave me a fill on my my nails. I mean, it's so funny looking back because we were in the ICU, but it, I remember when they waxed my eyebrows and I was like, ouch. And um, they were laughing so hard because they're like, you're getting poked in your stomach every hour with shots and you're worried about us ripping some hairs out of your eyebrows. It was just, I mean, here I am with all this stuff, as you saw in the picture. But anyway, it was funny. But the other thing I wanted to share real quick was when you talked about fight, that word, I never have liked that word. And my spiritual transformational experience was me being angry because you mentioned that. So I was mad because my cousin had texted my sisters and said, I know Holly's not doing well right now. Will you please read this to her? And it was basically a spiritual experience she had with some of our loved ones that had passed on and that they were all praying for me. And, you know, it was kind of about that. Well, I don't know if I went back in a coma or what happened, but I know I was not doing well. And I was praying i prayed a lot i prayed a lot that if if it's if this is my time just get me out of here this really sucks i don't like this and you know i'm suffering so either get me better or get me out of here that was my prayer well this particular time i was ticked off because my cousin was kind of like a sister you know that little rivalry and i said i'm the one suffering why is she getting that experience and i'm not i was mad and that was when my mom, who had passed away about a year and a half before, came to my side and said, it's not your time to go and you need to fight. And when she said fight above my bed was all my grandparents that had passed. All, they were all in white and they it's like my grandparents, my brother, my sister-in-law had passed away. I had a grandbaby that passed away that actually she was an adult, but I knew it was her. They all appeared in front of me and they started like for that support and they started chanting fight, fight, fight. And as soon, every time they'd say fight, I would get, you know, my husband came, my kids came, my friends came, all these people I knew came as far as you could see up past like people I didn't even know, which now I know those people I didn't know, I believe were all those people I was on prayer lists everywhere around the world because I had friends around the world and I had all that support. And it was that defining moment when I knew I was going to live. It was like that chant of fight, fight, fight. And it was like, okay, that's all I had to know was that I was going to live and I had it in me to stick it out and fight. And anyway, so I turned it into a good story. <laughs> Thank you. That I I needed that. I needed that truly. Miss Porter, you have been absolutely incredible, amazing. And again, I'm I'm so glad you're here. Absolutely. Miss Porter, what would you say? You've dropped so many nuggets this episode, so many heartfelt moments and so many encouraging words and so many life stories. If you had one more trick in the hat, if you had one more nugget to share to that young girl whose back is against the wall and she doesn't know what to do and she's fighting for her life, what would you say to her right now? Hmm, I would probably say, you're not finished till you're finished. So get that fight in you until the bitter end and make every day count. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Continue to fight. And I'll say this to you publicly, Miss Miss Porter. Keep fighting. Keep going. Don't ever quit. We need you. 
the world needs what you're doing. And so never give up. Thank awesome. You. Absolutely. Thank you, my audience, for tuning in to the Gentleman Style Podcast show. I hope this message was inspiring and encouraging and motivating and it compels you to not leave this world until you are finished and keep fighting, keep going. So thank you, Miss Porter. We have to let Miss Porter go. She has many more businesses. She has to get to 15 again. Now she has to get to 20. She's had 15. She has to get to 20 businesses, <laughs> startups, and continue to change the world for the better and make an impact and make a difference. And so we got to let her go. But we love you. We appreciate you. And like we always end every show, take care of your friends, take care of your family, and always, always, oh, Ms. Porter, how can we connect with you? How can we find you? How can we subscribe? Yeah, I'm on all social media channels. You can find me, Holly Porter. And hollyporter.com, you can send a contact through there. My email, holly at hollyporter.com. There you have it. Connect, 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 y'all. Get on board. And subscribe to that YouTube, YouTube channel, Hopeful Horizons Podcast. And if you have it to give, give and donate and help someone with, with long COVID and who's suffering and in need. It, it may be the last wish they get. So thank you all. Like we end every show, take care of your friends, take care of your family, and always, always take care of business. This is Marcus, your favorite gentleman, and Miss Holly Porter signing off.